Okay, so today we're going to talk about something really cool that just came out called API Clarity. And it's actually a tool that allows us to look at what's going on inside microservices. Now to step back for just a second, previously when we built applications that were monolithic, we had servers or virtual machines and we had to network those together uh, if it was layer two, we did it with switches. If they were across uh, different subnets, maybe we used a router, but they were networked together traditionally. Microservices are actually networked together in a very similar way, but we can do it using something called a service mesh. And that allows services between these microservices to actually talk to each other. Now, similar to switches, we used to be able to use a tool called Wireshark. So we could actually see how those devices were talking to each other, how those applications were talking. API Clarity is Wireshark for your microservices. And I'm gonna show you how to build it and how you can actually test it yourself, totally free. So there's a couple parts to what we're gonna to build today. So we're gonna build a Kubernetes cluster, but we're gonna do it using automation tool called Rancher that makes it really easy to do. And you can build it really, really fast. Once that's been built, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna build out a demo application that we need. So we're gonna use a demo application called SockShop. It's really cool. It's an entire e-web store that you can just deploy very quickly and have a working microservice environment for you to test your tools on. Then we're gonna deploy API Clarity and show you exactly how that works. So let's get right to it. So before we start, I wanna point out that everything we're doing today is actually located inside the GitHub repository for API Clarity. This video was published today when I published it, but this project is constantly being updated and changes are being made. So the readme may actually be modified uh, and the instructions may be modified. So make sure you look at the latest readme. And if you have any issues or, or problems, make sure you check and, and see if it's changed. So I'm gonna be following along with this today. So feel free to open this up in another screen and you can follow along as we're doing it. Okay, so the first step to get this going is we're gonna create a Kubernetes cluster. And to make that easy, I'm doing this using Rancher. Rancher is a tool you can use to create and manage clusters. It makes things really easy. I highly recommend you use this tool. It is so much faster than doing it on the command line, although you should do it on the command line at least once. So you can see how much work it is. But this will help you deploy it. Now, whether you're doing this on Amazon, Google Cloud, on VMware like I am, it doesn't matter, a rancher will make it really easy for you. So the first thing we're gonna do is create a cluster to do this with. So I'm gonna come over here, click create. And uh, these are the no, uh, the settings that we have. So VMware, and we're gonna tell it we wanna create a cluster in our VMware sandbox. So we're gonna call this the demo video cluster. And we're gonna create some control nodes. We'll call it DVC CP. And we'll add another pool here called DVC WK because we need worker nodes and I'm going to create one control plane and three worker nodes, which should be enough. And then over here on the right, we have to tell it what we want running in each pool. So there we go. Now you have to choose a template. And today we're just going to use eight gig, uh, eight CPU templates. That's more than enough for what we're doing. So this is a template I've pre-created. It's running uh, Ubuntu 2004, which works very well in Rancher to build Kubernetes clusters, highly recommend it. There are some fix up scripts out there to help you build your template, but it's just a basic template, it's nothing crazy. Uh, and that will get our Kubernetes environment up and running. There's nothing else in here for me to do. All I have to do is come down here and hit create. The existing providers and everything in my environment are fine. So I'm gonna click create. And the system is gonna go out and create that cluster for me of one control plane and three workers. And I don't have to do anything else. At this point, all I need to do is wait for that to be completed. So I'll be right back as soon as that's done. Okay, so only a few moments have gone by and our demo video cluster is up and running now. Uh, we can see it was created eight minutes ago. So I, I was serious when I said that this happens pretty quick. So it's up and running now. Uh, and we have our four nodes, one control, three worker, and we're ready to go and start deploying our software. Now, it's important to know that when you deploy API Clarity, it, really when you deploy a lot of applications in Kubernetes, you're going to need some kind of storage that's persistent. So you're gonna need persistent storage on your cluster. Now, that's very different depending on how you're deploying it. If you're doing it in Google or AWS, they have persistent storage options for you. If you're doing it in VMware, you could use VMware storage. 
Uh, you can also use local storage technically, uh, although it's not really it's something you would do necessarily in production. Or in our case, we're going to use NFS. Now, uh, from out of the box, we can't do NFS with ranchers super easily using what's called a storage class. Ideally, we want a storage class. And what that does is it allows us to create persistent volumes on demand. So as we're deploying either Helm charts or whatever it is we're deploying, it will automatically create those persistent volumes for us. See, in Kubernetes, persistent volumes are disks where data will be, will be placed. Software developers don't actually know anything about that because they just deploy their applications and then they claim, hey, I need some storage, so give me some storage. So when their application asks for storage, they expect the Kubernetes cluster to say, yeah, I have storage for you. Here it is, uh, using something called a volume claim. So we have to add a volume first. Now, in our environment, we're going to use NFS. But NFS, like I said, is not uh, supported in Rancher right out of the box. So we need to add an application to do that. So I'm going to go over here to Apps and Marketplace. And you can see there's a ton of applications that are built into the repository right out of the box. But doesn't have the one that we need. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a repository to our environment. And we're going to do that by clicking over here on chart repositories. And I'm actually going to create a repository here. And in this case, I'm going to call it the NFS repository because that's the only thing that's in this repository. I'm going to paste that in here. This is a GitHub repository for that NFS provisioner. And I'm going to click create. And now when I go back over here to available charts, and I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom here. I can see this one has been added, NFS subdirectory external provisioner. So this is a installable uh, Helm chart that gives us automatic provisioning for NFS subdirectories, which makes this super easy. So we're going to click install over here and install that. And you want to put it in your default namespace because we're going to be using this as uh, the default for the cluster. And you got to click on this little button, bottom left, customize options before install, or this will not work. So this is the actual chart, which says all of the details of how it's going to be installed. So in our case, we need to provide it with the NFS server and the NFS path of where we're going to be installing this. So the first thing we're going to do is give it our server. So we'll change this null to the name of our server. And then we're going to give it the path that we want it to actually mount on that NFS server. Make sure you get your permissions right. It has to have open permissions in order to get to that NFS in this case, we're serving it off of an NFS server, uh, so it might be a little bit different in your environment. And then down here, you'll see this as default class false. I'm going to change this to true, telling the system this is my default storage provider class. And then we're going to hit next and install, and that should take only a moment, and it'll be up and running. So... The installation is going to move forward and install that provisional for us. There you go, deployed, it's already done. I'm gonna go back in here in storage and just make sure, and you'll notice that now there's a storage class called NFS client. That's perfect. And we'll come back here later to show you that that claim actually worked and that that storage was taken effect. Now, before we start deploying API Clarity, we're going to need to create a application we can actually deploy it against. So we're going to use an application called Sock Shop. It's a demo microservice based e-store that has databases and message brokers and all the things you would typically have in a microservice based e-store. So we're going to deploy that first. But before we do that, we want to keep things a little bit organized. So we're going to create a project in here. And a project is basically a way for Rancher to keep all of the namespaces associated with, you know, one application, one project together. So we're going to call this the Sock Shop Project. And we're going to hit Create. That's going to create our project for us. And we'll see down at the bottom here, we can see Project Sock Shop has been created. Now, namespace. We're going to create a namespace for the application to run in. And namespace is like an a group of application microservices that are running within a namespace. So in this case, we're going to create one called sock-shop. And it's very important down here under labels that we actually add a label. And this is how we're going to tell it that we want to be able to run a service mesh. And we'll get into that in just a second. But for labels, we're actually going to put in here istio-injection. And the value is going to be enabled. And that's telling the system that we want to use Istio for this namespace. And we'll come back to that in a moment. So we'll create that. So we've now created our project 
called Sock Shop, and we have our namespace called Sock Shop. Now, what we want to do is install a service mesh into this project. A service mesh is kind of like a network switch for layer two, but it's switching um, between service applications. It's allowing microservices to talk to each other and send commands to each other, similar to the way we used to do it with layer two switches, except we're kind of switching application traffic instead of switching network traffic. So we're going to deploy Istio into this, into this project, and we can do that very easily with Rancher. So under apps and marketplace, there's actually an Istio install right here. So this will allow us to install Istio directly, uh, very, very easily and very quickly. So we're going to click install on Istio, and we're going to tell it we want to install it in the sock shop project. That way it's all kept in the right spot. And we don't need to do any customization on this one. We're going to hit next. Uh, we don't need Kiali. We're going to save the step and not install Kiali. It's another part of Istio that we don't really need. And we're going to click install. And that's going to go and install Istio within our cluster and get the service mesh up and running. Okay, literally 35 seconds have gone by and Istio is up and running. It makes it so much easier doing it in here. Okay, if we go back to our project and namespaces, we can see that within our project sock shop, we actually have the Istio system that is running. If we click on it, we can see everything is active. There's no errors or anything like that. So that's good news. It's up and running and it's functional. Okay, so from our projects and namespaces, we're gonna find our namespace for sock shop. We're gonna go in here and see that it's ready to go. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna actually deploy the sock shop application into this namespace. So we're gonna open up the kubectl shell again, and we're gonna actually paste in the command specifically for deploying our sock shop application. And you can see already our resources are climbing. This command will put everything in for you for that sock shop application and get it up and running. There's literally nothing else for you to do. So I'm gonna go back over here to workload on the left, and now we can see there is actually workloads running under our namespace. So there's our sock shop namespace, and we can see all of the microservices that are being installed. So everything from the catalog to the catalog database, the front end, the payment engine, the session database, all of these services are being installed. This will definitely take a few minutes for it to deploy. And once it's done, I'll be right back. Okay, so only a few minutes have gone by and the sock shop application is up and running. And if we look over here at the front end workload, we can see that there's actually a node port that's been built that allows us to get to the front end. So if we click on that for testing, there it is. We can see that it's working. And if we click on things like catalog, we can open the catalog and we can view details on products and we can add them to carts. So we know that this application is up and running and working. So now we can deploy API Clarity against it. So let's start by doing that. Back over here in Rancher, the first thing we need to do is gain access to our cluster from our local machine because we want to run kubectl commands, Kubernetes control commands against it. So installing kubectl is very easy. You can Google how to do it on your operating system. But before doing that, we have to be able to provide a configuration file to kubectl so it knows how to talk to our cluster. So up here on the top right, you'll see this little uh, folder says download kubeconfig. So what we're gonna do is download that kubeconfig onto our local system, and we're gonna put that file, uh, and we're gonna call it config in our kubectl, our Q, sorry, dot cube folder on our workstation, because that's the config on the machine that I'm using. So here I am on my local machine, and I'm gonna go into the dot cube folder, because that's the kubeconfig folder on my machine. I'm using a Mac. So I'm going to copy from my downloads folder, my demo video cluster.yaml file, and I'm gonna copy it into this folder, and I'm gonna call it config. You have to actually call it config, not .yaml. And now that it's there, let's check and see if it's working. So if I type kubectl get pods dash a, I can see that it's talking to the cluster and it's able to see all of the services that are running in there. We know our kubectl command is working. So now that we know that the kubectl command is working, we need to get a copy of the API Clarity repo. And in order to do that, the best way is to pull it down directly from GitHub. So we can use the git command to clone that repo onto our local system. So we're gonna type git clone and literally the, just the URL, and it's gonna copy everything from the API Clarity GitHub repo onto our local system. I'm gonna go into the API Clarity folder, and if I show everything in there, 
That's literally everything from the repo, right down to the logo and the readme. So everything is in there. So we're following along with this readme and the readme may be updated by the time you see this video. So feel free to go and read that readme and follow along to make sure that you're doing it specific to your environment. So the next thing we wanna do is actually install API Clarity in our environment. And that's very easy to do. There is a deployment YAML file that we've provided in there. You can just type this command, kubectl apply deployment API Clarity and hit enter. And that's going to push API Clarity into our environment, and it will install very quickly. Okay, back over here in our Rancher environment, under workloads, we can actually see there's a namespace here now for API Clarity. And we can see API Clarity application and the API Clarity database has been deployed. And remember we talked before about storage. This is where that came in, came in handy. So there's our persistent volumes, our persistent volumes that have been created specifically for that. And we can say that they've been claimed by these two applications, API Clarity and the database. So those have been created for us automatically. We didn't have to do anything because we have that storage class that we built. So now that that's up and running, we're ready to actually get it set up and working. Now, if I go over to my cluster and into my namespaces, you'll notice that API Clarity isn't in my project for Sock Shop. And that's because it deployed it down here, not in a project. So just to make this a little bit cleaner, make it easier for us, we're gonna click over here and actually move it into our API, or sorry, our Sock Shop application, and that'll make it a little bit easier for us to see everything. And now we can see it's located in there. So that's perfect. So back over on our workloads now, we can see that it's there, but there's no endpoint. We can't get to it. So we need to add that. So we're gonna click on the configuration over here on the right and edit our config. We're going to add a port. So we're, we don't need to create a service. There's actually already a service there. And I'm just going to call this web. And we're going to create a private container port as 8080. And that's the service uh, port that's running on it. Now we're doing something called a node port. So we need to give it a node port. It's a high port number that we can access the front end. So I'm just going to call this 32001. We're going to come down here and hit save. Now, you're going to get this application restarting because we've told it to make a config change. And as a result, it's going to want to restart. Now that it's restarted, we can actually see there's an endpoint there. And when we click on that endpoint, we can see the front end of API Clarity. But as we can see, there's nothing really going on in here. And that's because the next step is for us to actually deploy the filter against our application. Okay, so before API Clarity can see the communication back and forth between our microservices, similar to with Wireshark, we have to install an, an engine that allows us to capture that traffic. So kind of like PCAP, but this is for APIs. So the first thing we're gonna do is deploy those filters. So we've got a couple commands we've gotta do to do that. So first we're gonna bring in this sub module specifically called a WASM filter or WASM filter. And that's gonna give us the filter we need. It's a web assembly filter to get that done. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna run an update against that filter. So we get that all updated. Cool, now we have it checked out, we're ready to go. And we're gonna just go into the folder for that. And we can see that we have the filter that we need. So now we have to deploy this filter against our specific namespace for our application, not against the service mesh, not against API Clarity. It has to be deployed against our application, which is our sock shop show. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna type deploy.sh and we're gonna tell it we wanna go against sock shop. And then we're gonna hit enter and we're quickly gonna go back to our workloads and we're gonna watch what happens. So we type that command, it's adding the filter, and you can see it's patching all of those applications. And if I go back to our workload real quick and we scroll down, we'll see all of those applications are actually terminating and restarting. And that's because it's adding the appropriate filters into those applications so that we can watch what's going on to their APIs. Okay, so all of our services have restarted and if we click on our application, we can see that it is up and running again and we can click on things like our catalog. And for instance, we can open up our holy socks Maybe we can add them to a cart. There's all of the various things that we can do inside this application. So we know that it's running. But the question is, is API Clarity watching what's going on? 
So back over on our Rancher homepage, we're going to open up API Clarity again so that we can see what's going on. And look at that. We can actually see that our API is being detected here. And I can change this API usage to the show me the last five minutes. And it'll actually show me that there was APIs being used in here. That's really, really cool. And if we go down to this bottom tab on the left, I can see the exact API calls that are happening and what is going on, what host they're on, where they're going, what path they're going to. So we can really see what's going on with every single one of these at the same time. But that's really only one of uh, a few features that we have in API Clarity. The most important part of API Clarity is being able to create what's called an API spec. And that's a way of knowing what your API is doing and how it's being used and to make sure that things are happening the way you expect. Things are following a specification. So let's create some traffic. We're gonna go over here into our uh, catalog here and we're gonna click on a bunch of different things. We're gonna click on some of these. Maybe we'll go back to our catalog, click on another one. Uh, we're gonna add to cart a couple times. And what we're doing is creating API traffic. And the more of this we do, the more API Clarity is learning about all of the commands going back and forth in our application. So now that we've clicked on a couple things, let's go back and refresh API Clarity and see what it sees now. So if I refresh it, we'll see that it's learned there's more than one API here. There's a catalog API, there's a cart API. And if we go over here, we can see all of those. There's different APIs running with different hosts and we can actually see where they're running. Now, right now, it doesn't see any specification differences because we haven't provided a spec yet. So if you go over here on the inventory, we can see our APIs. We have one called catalog and one called carts that's been detected. However, we don't have a specification. Now, you have the ability to provide a specification if you want. Uh, but we don't have a specification for this application. So in this case, I'm going to go over to carts here and I could upload this and there is a standard format for these, but we actually allow you to construct your API uh, specification. So if I click review reconstructed spec, I can see that here it is. This is the specification. There's get and post methods, but there is a parameter it doesn't recognize. It says, I, I, I don't know what this parameter is. Uh, but I do, because we know what this application is. We know that that's actually the cart ID. So let's make this easier. We'll put cart ID in there, hit OK. And we're going to actually say, yeah, this is good. This is the specification that we expect. So I'm going to click Approve. And now that specification has been saved. So API Clarity says, OK, I understand how the cart works. And anytime there's an issue with the cart where it's being used in a different way, I'm going to know about it. So we're going to go back over here. And just to show you, we're going to go into our catalog. We're going to add a couple more socks to our cart, four items, five items. Uh, I like all sorts of different, oh, I like cross socks. Those are cool too. So we've got all these items in our cart. And if I go back to API Clarity and I refresh, right? It says, oh, there's a diff here. It says, I'm seeing things I'm not expecting. So we can actually go in here and say, show me the reconstructed spec diff. And it says, oh, somebody used a different format. So somebody, we were expecting to see a double and we actually got integer. So we can see where the difference is. So let's do one more just so we can show. I'm gonna go over here back to our application into our cart and I'm gonna actually delete something out of our cart because we haven't done that yet. And we created our spec without doing that. So now that I've deleted some items, let's go back to API Clarity to our main page and refresh it again. We can see there's a ton of diffs going on here. And I can even go back into my events and see, oh, there's stuff going on. Look, there's a spec difference. We're seeing things happening that are out of specification for this API. Well, can you show me what's happening? Yes, we can. So we can see specifically what's happening. There's commands that we're not expecting that are happening in here. And I can expand it out and see the entire call and see all of the things that it wasn't expecting. So this is a good way to go back to your developers and say, hey, look, something's going on in your API that we're not expecting, or you're not following the rules that we've set up for how to use this API to ensure that APIs are being used properly. So if somebody was doing something with your API you didn't expect, uh, and there was something happening in your web store that you didn't expect, you could use this to go in and say, oh, someone's taking advantage of our API, or maybe someone's making calls to it from another site that we don't expect. So there's all sorts of different reasons why having an API specification is super important. And this tool is basically, like I said, Wireshark for APIs. 
So there you go. It's super easy to deploy API Clarity and try it out for yourself. What's really neat is we used to work in this world where we had these switches and switches were just kind of replaced by service meshes and, and, and Wireshark was replaced by API Clarity. And we can see what's going on between these applications at the application layer. We can watch what's going on and make sure that it's working the way we want. So this is really cool. Microservices are no longer this hidden thing running inside the cloud where you can't really tell what's going on between them and you can't put a Wireshark in there and get information out. So we're trying to give you tools that are gonna help you run your applications and manage them and make sure they're running properly and safely. So thanks for watching this demo video today and we'll see you on the next one.